Ever since the first launch of the Space Shuttle on April 12, 1981, there have been concepts and ideas floating around for how to best turn the side-mounted space plane into a super heavy lift rocket. As the shuttle continued to fly, more and more of these concepts and ideas came and went. Some would take the orbiter off the side and replace it with a cargo hold. Others would redesign the vehicle as an inline launcher, but most of them never even left the drawing board. While well, a few of these concepts did manage to get mock-ups built, and the Ares-1 even had a flight test of a dynamically similar vehicle known as the Ares-1X, only one shuttle-derived rocket would ever truly complete development and enter into operation. This is NASA's up-and-coming space launch system. But between the flights of the Ares-1X and the selection of the SLS rocket, there was one final concept for a shuttle-derived launch vehicle. This would be the last shuttle-derived concept to be studied in detail as a potential launcher before the selection of the SLS rocket. This was the Jupiter Direct series of rockets. The story of Jupiter Direct begins with a dying constellation program. Towards the later years of the program, it was becoming clearer and clearer just how unfeasible this program really was. By 2009, the only progress that had been made on any of the rockets was a test flight of a vehicle that was similar in shape to Ares-1, known as the Ares-1X. There had been no J-2X testing, a single static fire of a 5-second solid rocket booster, and no production of any of the tanks for either the Ares-1 or the Ares-5. A new solution was clearly needed. To address this, the Direct team decided to return to the shuttle-derived roots of the Constellation program. The Ares rockets were originally intended to share as much hardware in common with the Space Shuttle program as possible to help speedline development of the vehicles. However, as time went on and the scope of the program increased, the rockets had to get bigger and more efficient. As such, more and more of the original shuttle-derived plans had to be sidelined, so much so that by the end of the program, the only feature either of the two Ares rockets had retained from the shuttle were the solid rocket boosters, and even that was an upgraded 5-segment variant for Ares 1 and a 5.5-segment variant for Ares 5, as opposed to the shuttle's original 4-segment design. Jupiter Direct, however, would attempt to take what the shuttle program had already developed and simply modify it to serve a multitude of different purposes. To do this, Direct would need to modify the Space Shuttle external fuel tank and turn it into the core stage of this new rocket. First, the aft bulkhead of the Shuttle ET would need to be slightly modified to allow for an engine section to be attached at the bottom of the stack. This engine section would then utilize anywhere between two to four of the RS-25 engines that had already been developed for the Space Shuttle program. From here, the top half of the liquid oxygen tank would be removed and mirrored to the bottom half after which it would then receive a forward skirt to allow the mounting of interstages or payload fairings on top of the vehicle. This modified external fuel tank would now be known as the Jupiter Core Stage, and it would be common to every flight of the vehicle. The primary goal of doing this would be to preserve as much of the shuttle ET production lines as possible at the Mishud Assembly Facility in order to create a seamless transition from STS to Direct. In fact, so little ended up actually being changed with the new Jupiter core stage that the Direct team estimated that Mishud would not need to receive any major modifications to support such a design, and the stage could be built right alongside other Space Shuttle external fuel tanks. Once production of the stage was completed, it would make its way down to the Kennedy Space Center where it was to be integrated onto a mobile launcher. This process too would be heavily derived from the original Space Shuttle design. Firstly, the orbiter would need to be removed, as would the external fuel tank. These would then be replaced by the Jupiter core stage with its integrated engines and engine section. This initial variant would only utilize two RS-25 engines for low Earth orbit variants, and would have its instrument ring and its payload bearing mounted directly to the core stage. Finally, the Orion spacecraft, the one part of the Constellation program to actually enter operation, would be mounted on top of the stack, creating the base variant of the direct rocket the Jupiter-120. This base variant of the Jupiter rocket would be able to place up to 43.7 metric tons into low Earth orbit. And of this 43.7 metric tons, 17.2 metric tons can be co-manifested with an Orion spacecraft. Adding a third engine to the mix brings us to the second variant of the direct rocket, the Jupiter-130. This third engine allows the payload capacity to be increased drastically, 
from 43.7 metric tons to 77.8 metric tons to a lower Earth orbit, of which 51.3 tons can be co-manifested with an Orion spacecraft. More powerful variants of the Jupiter rocket would also include a fourth engine and, more importantly, a second stage. One potential upper stage proposed by the direct team would have utilized six RL-10 B2 engines. This brings us to the third variant of the direct rocket, the Jupiter 246. The addition of a second stage drastically increases the payload capacity of the vehicle from a mere 77.8 metric tons to an incredible 101.8 metric tons to low Earth orbit. This variant of the rocket was also capable of sending approximately 39.5 metric tons of payload on a translunar injection, or up to 79 metric tons if the payload rendezvoused with the second stage on low Earth orbit. Another proposed upper stage for the direct rocket would have featured a single J-2X engine. This brings us to our final variant of the direct rocket, the Jupiter-241. This upper stage would have increased the LEO performance of the direct rocket from the already incredible 101.8 metric tons of the 246 to 119.9 metric tons. In addition to this, it would have been able to send approximately 46.1 tons on a translunar injection or up to an incredible 92.1 metric tons to a translunar injection if the payload rendezvoused with the second stage in low Earth orbit. Across these four potential variants of the Jupiter rocket was an impressive range of payload capacities and capabilities. But that inevitably brings us to the important question. Why? Why did the direct team suggest using this rocket and its many potential variants? Well, it all comes down to the goal of direct. To not just replace the Constellation program, but to replace the Space Shuttle program as well. After having been flown 135 times over 30 years, the Space Shuttle was finally about to be retired. The only problem was that the program that was supposed to replace it, the Constellation program, was having major technical and financial issues that would eventually lead to its cancellation in 2010, just one year before the Space Shuttle program concluded in 2011. This was a major issue, because without Constellation, the United States would have no crewed access to space at all, and even worse, no plans to regain that capability in the future. The direct team now had to replace both the Space Shuttle program and the Constellation program at the same time while being cheaper to operate than both of them. This is the reason why the Jupiter rocket had so many potential variants. It was trying to replace three completely different rockets with one single rocket that was essentially a modified shuttle stack. This modular system would allow each variant of the rocket to fill a niche of either the Space Shuttle, Ares-1, or Ares-5. The Jupiter-120 would have taken the place of the Space Shuttle, carrying payloads of up to 17.5 metric tons to low Earth orbit with the Orion spacecraft and a crew of up to six astronauts. The Jupiter-130 would have taken the place of the Ares-1 as the rocket that would launch Orion into orbit, but it would also launch the Altair into low Earth orbit at the same time. The Orion spacecraft and Altair lunar module combined weighed 77 metric tons, and the Jupiter-130 could put 78.8 metric tons into low Earth orbit. This left the Jupiter-241 to then take the place of the Ares-5, sending the 77-ton spacecraft on a translunar injection to the moon. By using a single rocket to perform the function of three separate rockets and two different programs, Direct was capable of driving down the cost of the program by an incredible amount. Where the shuttle would have cost $32,385 per kilogram in 2009, the Jupiter rockets would have been able to achieve a cost per kilogram of a mere $4,815. This seems like such an incredibly great idea using what worked from the shuttle program to continue the shuttle capabilities and replace the Constellation capabilities, all for an incredibly low price. So what happened? Why did Jupiter never leave the drawing board? Why did Direct never fly? The answer to that question is simple. It will, next year. When Congress mandated that NASA was to build a space launch system derived from shuttle components back in October of 2010, the direct team released the following statement. 
The direct team congratulates and applauds the President, Senate, and House of Representatives for passing legislation enabling NASA to begin work on the Space Launch System Heavy Lift Launch Vehicle based on existing shuttle components. In 2006, the direct team began promoting a similar inline launcher and over the next four years continued to refine the concept into the direct architecture and the Jupiter family of launch vehicles. NASA has now begun developing their new launch vehicle based on virtually identical concepts. As a result, the direct team has brought its all-volunteer effort to a successful conclusion. We did everything we set out to do, and we declare success, said Chuck Longton, direct team co-founder. Thank you guys for checking out my video. I hope it was well worth your time. If you enjoyed it, make sure to give it a thumbs up and subscribe to the channel. If you'd like to see more videos of mine in the future, make sure to ring the notification bell so you can be notified of future videos. That's all for today, and I'll see you guys in the next video. Bye!